excuse me, excuse me. Uh, no, 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 not the Grim Reaper you're thinking of. That's my brother Grim. I'm Grim with two M's. Oh, God, that was annoying growing up. Anyway, while he shepherds souls across the river of death, I tell fairy tales. Anyway, he has an ancient fairy tale I just made up about a space traveler lost in the cosmos and longing for Halloween on Earth. I call it Lost Traveler, or Halloween on Earth. Enjoy! Up in the cosmos, a traveler roams, lost in the darkness, far from his home. On this eerie Halloween, no hope, no trace, stuck in the abyss, a never-ending chase. Lost forever in the depths of space, haunted by shadows in the Here's the top 10 ways space is trying to kill you. With Ethan Seagull, host of Starts with a Bang. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion and Happy Halloween. I'm James Maynard. Now this week for our Halloween special, we'll be looking at the top 10 ways space is trying to kill you. Later in the show, we'll be talking with astrophysicist and science educator Ethan Siegel, host of Starts with a Bang. So, let's dive right in, shall we? Here are the top 10 ways space is trying to kill you. Number 10, alien invasion. Now, planetary invasions by militant extraterrestrials, a staple of sci-fi, usually involve E.T. with a bad attitude, hell-bent on stealing our resources, and, uh, and or turning us into appetizers. But let's be real, the chances of this happening are slimmer than a stick insect on a diet. Hey, I prefer the term svelte insect. Thank you very much. Why? Because it's all thanks to the cosmic speed limit, the speed of light. Now, even traveling close to this breakneck pace, a trip to the nearest star would take years. So unless aliens have cracked the code on warp speed, or they really like road trips, we're probably safe. Extraterrestrial drones? Eh, who knows? Number nine, the Kessler effect. As we keep sending more satellites into orbit above Earth, it's getting crowded up there. Imagine two satellites playing chicken and colliding. They shatter, creating more debris, which destroys more satellites, which creates more debris. And voila, we have the Kessler effect, a domino effect of collisions creating a junk space junkyard above our planet. This cloud of clutter could wreak havoc on satellites and spacecraft, including occupied space stations. Although the immediate threat to people on Earth would be minimal, such a chain reaction of debris could cripple communications, guidance, weather forecasts, and space travel for decades or more to come. Number 8. Coronal Mass Ejections, or CMEs. Uh, these massive eruptions from the sun are seen on a regular basis, and nearly all of these miss Earth. 
We're an extremely powerful CMB to strike our planet, our electronics and electrical devices to go haywire, or even catch fire. Now, again, the number of deaths from such an event would be low, but such a scenario could plunge us into a world without electricity, leading to chaos. I'm loving it. Number seven, a nearby supernova. A supernova is a powerful and luminous explosion of a supermassive star. If such a stellar eruption were to occur close enough to Earth, say within 30 to 50 light years, it could have significant effects on our planet. Right now, our cosmic neighborhood seems pretty chill. I mean, no nearby stars are waving the I'm about to go supernova sign. But hey, the universe loves a good plot twist. Enter stage left, rogue stars moving into our neighborhood during our Earth's joyride through the galactic plane that could bring us closer to supernova territory one day. It's like a cosmic game of musical chairs, and we're just hoping we're not left standing when the music stops. Number six, the black hole versus Earth. And this is like cosmic dodgeball with a twist. Both involve something hurtling towards us, triggering our planetary defenses. But while we might stand a chance against an asteroid, a black hole is just a different beast altogether. It's not just massive, it warps space-time itself, devouring... You know what? You know what? This is, this is about how it would go down. Breaking news, folks. A black hole is heading towards Earth. Oh, like an asteroid. We've got that famous actor on speed dial. No, Tom. This isn't a movie. And a black hole isn't just a massive object. It's a warp in space-time itself. Space! Time! What now? Imagine the universe is a trampoline. A black hole is like an elephant sitting in the middle. It gobbles up everything. Planets, stars, even light. So, we can't just push it aside? Afraid not, Tom. If it's heading our way, we'd better hope humanity has a plan for interstellar travel. Which, by the way, we don't. I... I see. Well, that's a lot to take in. Maybe if we all turn our fans on at once, we can blow it away? Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on the Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by astrophysicist, renowned science communicator, and host of Starts with a Bang, Ethan Siegel, talking about the top 10 ways space is out to kill you. And it is. Welcome to the show, Ethan. Yeah, thank you for having me. You know, a lot of people look at space as this vast expanse of the unknown. But uh, let me tell you, as far as life is concerned, you're a lot happier here on Earth than you are out there in the <laughs> catastrophic universe, where so little of what you need to survive is actually out there. Right, right. And space can be a hazardous place, even if you are on the Earth, as the dinosaurs figured out. But it after 160 million years of roaming the planet. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that uh, our relationship with the universe is one of, uh, well, we're, we're glad that uh, we can exchange energy with it because if it wasn't for the energy of the sun, uh, we would have a lot of problems with life here on Earth. But we also have this very difficult thing that there are all sorts of other things coming into Earth 
from electromagnetic radiation to particles to things much, much bigger than particles. Uh, it's it's we're very fortunate that our planet has been resilient so far and that none of the catastrophes that have befallen Earth have wiped out life entirely. We we seem to have gotten under our planet's skin. And every time something comes to wipe us out, we come back and rebuild stronger than ever. Mm. And, you know, there are probably several ways that um, space could wind up killing a lot of people, if not everyone, uh, <laughs> on the planet. And, uh, and there's certainly a lot of sci-fi movies made about it. But, you know, of all the possibilities, giant asteroids, solar flare, uh, gamma ray bursts, you know, which one do you think poses the greatest hazard to our planet and how come? Well, you know, you got to look at what's common around here. And for me, uh, the asteroid strikes one is a really big one because of two reasons. Number one, uh, we get hit by stuff all the time. Most of it, thankfully, is small. And the big stuff is not like as abundant as it used to be. Mm -hmm. But there's this little problem, right? Over long periods of time, stars throughout the Milky Way uh, pass by one another. And this surprises a lot of people, but uh, approximately a handful of times every million years, another star or almost star will actually pass through our solar system's Oort cloud, that big diffuse spheroidal distribution of comet-like objects that just hang out there. And whenever this happens, uh, you get these gravitational perturbations and many of these objects will get hurled into the inner solar system. All it takes is one planet killer to hit us and it's game over for life on Earth. A lot of us don't really like to think about really long-term civilization stuff, but uh, when we think about the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, we can calculate how much energy it hit Earth with. Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest meteor shower we get every year is the Perseids, which comes from its parent comet, Comet Swift-Tuttle. If Swift-Tuttle were to strike the Earth, it would give off somewhere between 25 and 30 times the energy of that dinosaur killing impact. And it is, according to NASA and the objects it tracks, NASA has called this the single most dangerous object to all of humanity. Uh, we know for thousands of years we're safe from its orbit. Hmm. But in the year 4479, uh, just before that close encounter with Earth, we know it's going to be gravitationally affected by Jupiter. Mm. Jupiter is going to change its orbit a little bit. And there's a chance, some are saying, well, it's only like one in a million. One in a million chance that about 2,400 years from now, we're going to get struck by a human killing and possibly Earth killing asteroid or comet like object. Um, I hope we have an asteroid comet redirection program up and operational before then, because if we wait till after then, that just seems like rolling the dice in a wholly unnecessary fashion. So if you want to know, like, what are you worried about completely destroying humanity from space in the relatively near term future, I would say 4479 Comet Swift Tuttle and a potential catastrophic collision is something we absolutely need to keep our eyes on. Hmm. And, you know, there have been recent reports that supposedly, what, 99.9% .9 or something like that of planet killers have already been mapped or, um, don't remember the exact details, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, they, they can say that as far as objects in the asteroid belt go and maybe even as far as objects in the Kuiper belt go but if you want to talk about objects that are from beyond the Kuiper belt we've mapped almost none of them 
if mm. you want to talk about objects from other stellar systems, not our own solar system, but other stellar systems that pass through our own, we've mapped exactly zero of them. So, you know, you could say, well, you know, we map 99.9% .9 of the things we know, which make up this much of the dangerous stuff out there. And then there's all this other dangerous stuff out there that we haven't mapped. Don't you feel safe knowing about this 99.9% .9 of this tiny bit that we know? My answer is no, <laughs> why would you? <laughs> And of course, we don't even need a planet killer to wipe out the the planet. I mean, a city a city killer comes down. Is that a well, scene? I mean, the one just... the one that wiped out the dinosaurs, we call that a planet killer because it will it won't kill all life on the planet. It'll only cause a mass extinction event that kills everything bigger than an iguana. So you know, like, well, last time I looked. We were all bigger than iguanas, and I'm not really looking forward to that repeating <laughs> itself. And, of course, we have a giant fusion reactor just, you know, 150 million kilometers away from us. And the sun keeps spouting out eruptions and coronal mass ejections. and So you get these things, right? You've got the... the the puny, paltry, continuous solar wind stream of particles. And then every once in a while you get these flares where you have these like magnetic loops that break and reconnect and they shoot out big flares from the sun. And then you get the, oh, well now my magnetic jets are gonna interact with the corona and we'll reconnect and get these even more powerful coronal mass ejections. Right. The thing is every few hundred years, uh, and it's even worse, we get really big ones every few thousand years, uh, we get hit with a really large solar flare. Most of them, lucky for us, uh, miss Earth, because if you're around the equator of the sun, there's only a little chance that you're going to hit Earth right where it is in its orbit. Right. Most of your ones are going to miss. Now, most of the time, when these things come, Earth's magnetic field does a good job of protecting us, and right, these particles come in, they spiral down, the worst they'll do is create an aurora. Except when you get these really energetic events, they can go all the way down from the poles to the equators and create these planet-wide aurorae like we got in 1859. If we didn't have any technology on the surface, we didn't have electricity, electrification, uh, electronics, all of this stuff, it'd be fine. All that would happen would birds would wake up at night, animals would be confused, you'd get a few like, oh, like, what's going on with all these lights and whatever, nice show, big deal, go to bed. Okay, no, with electronics, the big problem is you make induced currents. You have a loop or a coil of wire anywhere, and this changing magnetic field induces a current, which means you can unplug your electronics and they'll still catch fire. Right. Which is really bad, not just <laughs> in your house, but really bad for electrical grids and things that handle large amounts of current. We estimate if the event that happened in 1859 would happen today on Earth, we would have our very first 11 figure dollar natural disaster. We would be talking about we would be talking about hundreds of billions, trillions, even 10 plus trillion globally dollars worth of damage, um, which is, you know, going to destroy a ton of infrastructure. Millions of people will starve to death or will lack food and shelter and clean water. Um, it will be a tremendous disaster. And we like humans normally do, we haven't prepared for this at all. We don't even have sufficient grounding on power stations and substations. So yeah, this isn't a civilization killer event by any means, but you know, in terms of a disaster, this is something that we know is inevitable and that we haven't prepared for at all. <laughs> it's amazing how often that happens. <laughs> And when we talk... Who could have predicted it? <laughs> Certainly not a Cassandra-level scientist that nobody listens to. That would cost money. <laughs> yeah, every horror movie seems to start with people ignoring scientists, doesn't it? 
I mean, it was people ignoring prophets 3,000 years ago. And if there's one way I know to prophecy the future correctly, it's to use science. But what do I know? I'm only a scientist. <laughs> and, of course, one of the coolest, I think, most amazing objects in, in the cosmos are, of course, black holes. Is, uh, what would happen if uh, one of these little black holes, say, the size of a large star or larger came and so if these things are out there believe it or not when you're far away from them they act just like any other mass uh mount everest and a black hole the mass of mount everest if they were floating through space you wouldn't be able to tell until they got closer to you than the size of mount everest itself so for most things it's just like any other mass you only worry about its gravitational effects but of course if it hits you catastrophe right black hole hits you what's going to happen to you well your head's going to be attracted to it more than your limbs and you're going to be torn apart in this awful spaghetti like fashion where where your very atoms get ripped apart from one another and stretched into a long thin strand before all getting sucked into the black hole but that's as likely as getting hit by a star in the Milky Way. The only difference is we can see a star coming because it's luminous, and with a black hole, you have to be a lot more careful. So I'm not as worried about that. But what I am a little bit worried about is wherever you have star-forming regions in the universe, like just in the Orion Nebula nearby, or the Omega Nebula, or the Eagle Nebula, or all these other star-forming regions in the galaxy, you produce high-mass, short-lived stars. And when you make these, they will, the most massive ones will die in a supernova explosion. We definitely don't want to be within range of one of those when it goes off. And we really don't want to get caught in what's called a hypernova explosion or a superluminous supernova explosion, where you get a supernova that produces these powerful collimated jets. And if one of those jets struck us, um, we'd live in this kind of really interesting situation where 50% of Earth, the hemisphere that was facing the superluminous supernova at the time it went off, mm -hmm. would be completely sterilized. Mm -hmm. And the other side of the world would largely be fine. So it's almost like in getting hit by one of these explosions or bursts uh, would be like Thanos from Marvel Comics snapping his fingers and which 50 percent of the earth are you on are you on the half that survives or the half that got evaporated well fun stuff uh hope you don't get hit anytime soon <laughs> and as you mentioned our uh magnet the earth's magnetic field and our atmosphere protect us from almost all the radiation especially the high-end side of the spectrum. I mean, it's, it, side, it's but... all about uh, flux. It's all right. about the total amount of energy that hits your planet. If you're talking about what's our sun doing, oh, please, at the energies our sun produces particles, we're safe. All you're going to do is produce a little particle shower in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. It won't even make it down to the surface. But if you're talking about something like a gamma ray burst, this would be like shining the light from several million suns on Earth at once. That's too much. Even our atmosphere would be like, I give up, <laughs> right? It would just be like too much energy too fast. At the very least, every creature on the surface would get a massive radiation dose that is way over the lethal level uh, as far as radiation is concerned. So even if you weren't vaporized immediately, you would have this disgusting cancerous fate of radiation poisoning, uh, probably not so dissimilar to what happened to the victims of Hiroshima back in 1945. Wow. Wow. Yeah. All right. So I'm uh, just curious... You know, I think the chances of, you know, there seem to be so many barriers to intelligent aliens ever reaching Earth. Uh, and, you know, but it's a classic sci-fi story, the cat running away from flying saucers. Um, <laughs> classic. Yeah. Classic, yeah. obviously. <laughs> 
But um, do you see any scenario where um, where alien civilizations could come down and be and be uh, bad news for the human race? I mean, you know, we 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 have that as sort of a science fiction trope, and honestly. I put our odds of facing an alien invasion at about the same odds I put Godzilla protecting Earth from an alien invasion. Oh, so, so um, <laughs> you know, it's really like how many how many angels do you really want on the head of your pin there when you talk about this? But right, I, right, right. for me, the biggest danger of alien would not be like, oh, there's a hostile species and they found Earth and look at this fragile ecosystems that humans are struggling to manage their own civilization and the health of the planet. Let's come in and wipe out all the humans and steal all the resources. Like, what are you talking about resources? Like, what do you really want that's so abundant on Earth? Like, it's just a biosphere. Like... If this is if this is what you came for, why come to a planet that has an intelligent species on it already? I don't understand. But right, maybe right. there are things out there in the universe that I don't understand. And so fine. Alien species come in. The bigger thing I'd be worried about is let's say we get hit by something that brings alien life to Earth on us. Mm. Our immune system has never evolved to combat an alien pathogen. I would be much more worried about something like the Andromeda right. strain mm. than I would about something like Independence Day. Right. But again, what do I know? I'm only a scientist. <laughs> I don't live in the realm of, let me find something absurd to be afraid of. <laughs> That's great. Finally, how do, how do you see artificial intelligence um helping us detect and mitigate threats from space oh i mean artificial intelligence is great for spotting patterns that humans are terrible at spotting right, right? right. there are all these patterns that exist there are all these things that we know how to look for them and then there are the things that yeah, they exist out there and humans don't really know how to look for them. That's what artificial intelligence is good for. That's what machine learning in large data sets is great for teaching us. So if you want to get into the nitty gritty, that's how that sort of thing works is you say, hey, um, we know all of these threats are out there and here are the ones we're looking for, right? We're looking for like I told you, that 99.9% .9 of things we know are a threat for us uh, that are right in our own backyard. But we don't really know how to look for like, oh, well, what if something came straight towards us from the sun facing side where we don't monitor? That's a great thing for art artificial intelligence to take on. Hey, if we know when the next star is going to pass through our Oort cloud, uh, can we come up with a way to know what sort of threats this might create over the next million or two years as these gravitational perturbations come and cause objects to be sent in our direction? That would be the sort of thing that artificial intelligence and machine learning are really excellent at preparing us for as far as threats go. Um, I feel the bigger danger, though, is with humans who use artificial intelligence and machine learning irresponsibly. Um, I have been appalled over my life as I have seen the most common computer program become a computer virus, become malware, become spyware, become a vehicle for humans to do violence against other humans with. And that, I think, is the biggest arena where artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, needs to not only be regulated, but weaponized to stop those sorts of attacks. Um, because, you know, the greatest danger to ourselves is never anything external to us. It's ourselves. It's ourselves. Yeah. Humans are the greatest danger to humans and always have been. Most dangerous animal to humans? Humans. Most dangerous animal to Earth? Humans. Like, this is what we do. We have this great capacity for compassion, for learning, for understanding, for sharing this knowledge, but we also have a great capacity for destruction. And that's the thing we need to fight against more than any threat that's coming to us externally. Hmm, interesting. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Ethan. It was fabulous talking with you. 
Yeah, thanks for having me on. I hope uh, even though it's spooky season, you're a little less scared of what's Ooh. out there if Maybe you're a little better November informed. <laughs> <laughs> and that was uh, Ethan Siegel, astrophysicist, science communicator, and host of Starts With a Bang. Check it out. Now, before we hear about the top five ways space is trying to kill you, we welcome astrophysicist Ethan Siegel to the show. Number five, alien virus invades Earth. Imagine an alien virus landing on Earth, say, aboard a meteorite. Sounds scary, right? But unless it's tailor-made for Earthlings, it's probably harmless. Interestingly, however, we found the same amino acids in space that are the building blocks of life here on Earth. Now, while this doesn't guarantee extraterrestrial life forms have chemical simul similarities to life here, it does tickle the imagination. Could there be a cosmic connection between life forms spread across the universe directed by the laws of chemistry and physics? The odds of an alien virus spelling disaster for life on Earth are slim, but in the vastness of the cosmos? Who knows? Number four, magnetar mayhem. Picture a neutron star, but give it a magnetic field so strong it would make Magneto blush. These overgrown toy magnets of the cosmos called magnetars are the most magnetic objects known. Every star has its tantrums, but when these magnetars throw a fit, it's a sight to behold, letting out a burst of radiation that could outshine thousands of suns. If one of these cosmic tantrums were directed at Earth, well, let's just say we'd feel the burn. Number three, starstruck. Picture this, a star passing by decides to stir up some trouble in our peaceful Oort cloud, the icy neighborhood at the edge of our solar system. This celestial bowily nudges one of the cloud's mountainous residents, sending it streaking toward us like a rebellious comet with its long period attitude. Now this cosmic gate crasher could potentially crash our party here on Earth, with a dangerous one-sided celestial snowball fight. This is probably not likely to happen for a few million years at least, but let's keep it on your calendar never, nevertheless. Number two, the warming sun boils away oceans. As our sun ages, it's gradually becoming hotter. Now in a billion years or so, maybe less, maybe more, it will brighten up so much that Earth's oceans could boil away, turning into steam. Having the atmosphere full of steam might seem like a great way to get a decent cuppa, as well as saving on sauna fees. However, it would lead to a runaway greenhouse effect, making Earth uninhabitable. In less than a billion years, the only living beings alive will likely be tardigrades, a few birds, and people who live in Arizona. But it's a dry heat! Number one, Asteroid Arcade. Picture space as a giant game of cosmic bumper cars with asteroids and comets zip, zip, zipping around. Every so often, one of these celestial speeders heads straight for Earth, causing an impact event. Now, most of these are just minor fender benders, but some have left serious dents in Earth's history, not to mention our crust, even playing a role in extinction. Oh my god. A direct hit can cause quite the spectacle, leading to significant damage and even global climate changes. In the year 4479, Comet Swift Tidal could potentially strike Earth following a close encounter with Jupiter. Called the single most dangerous object known to humanity, an impact with swift tidal could be 25 to 30 times more disastrous than the impact that ended the age of dinosaurs. Even a smaller impact could lead militaries around the globe to react to an enemy attack that never took place, potentially having calamitous consequences. 
Uh, dinosaurs didn't have space programs. We do. Supporting space science means keeping an eye or two out for these incoming mountains. Probably a good idea. Next week on the Cosmic Companion, we're going to be looking at the question of why do we explore? We'll be talking with John Waterman, creator of Atlas of Wild America. Make sure to join us starting on the 4th of November for our only show of the month as we enter the holiday season. If you've made it this far in the episode, I'm going to assume you enjoyed it. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you say something? I might have dozed off for a moment. Or you just skip to the end like reading a mystery novel. Eh, what ifs? So, maybe you know someone else who might like the Cosmic Companion. Go ahead and subscribe, like, follow, and share, and do all that good stuff anywhere you find our show. Clear skies.